Okay, so good afternoon. Um, my name is Nick Holliman. Uh, among many other things, I am Director of CUSP London and I'm also the lead on the Turing Network Development Award for Kings. And we're trying to bring together seminars of topics of interest uh, to people within Kings or within the AI and data science community. And I'm very pleased today that we've got Jim Weber, Chief Scientist at Neo4j, who works on systems research around fault tolerance, according to his notes. <laughs> I can read here. Um, but I know from Newcastle days, he's um, can probably tell you his career himself, but he, he used to work in a company in Newcastle. And did you do your PhD in Newcastle as well? Yeah. So before I moved here in January, I was also at Newcastle. So there's lots of good things come from Newcastle is the, is the message. Um, and I'm pleased today he's going to talk to us a humane overview of knowledge graphs and graph data science, which is exactly what I think we need. Jim. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> Hello everyone, thank you for coming and giving up uh, some of your lovely sunny day to sit in a darkened room. That's that's the first sunny day we get, or well, first sunny week we get, we're all computer nerds in the dark room, no glare, right, uh, closing the blinds. So I'm Jim, I work at Neo4j, we're a graph database company, and graph databases are lovely, they are filing cabinets with a really cool data model that allows you to make sense of things that are connected to other things. Uh, that's a probably an enormous oversimplification, but I hope uh, over the course of the next kind of 45 minutes or so, we'll unravel some of that. And I hope that will pique your interest uh, in graph databases, both from a systems point of view, which is where I work. I work building graph databases, which is fascinating. And um, uh, I, I worry about when, when things fail. That's, that's my job, which is why I've got such a sunny disposition. Uh, and indeed, from a user perspective, because I think graph databases and graph data science are really useful tools for helping us to make sense of the world in which we live. Sound good? Anyone want to run? No, you're all stuck now. This is kind of a social contract that's kicked in. You had the first 30 seconds while I was mumbling to leg it, and now, now we're locked in. The people online are thinking, yeah, I'll give it five minutes. Um, so I was asked to do a humane uh, our introduction to graph databases and graph data science. And, and I told this to one of my colleagues who helpfully gave a, a pictorial representation of how he sees it going. Um, it, it could well go this way. Yeah, it could, could go this way. So um, uh, this, this, is, th this is actually not just a dumb kind of meme slide. Um, I, I am jet lagged. I've been across the Atlantic several times in the last couple of weeks. I'm a bit battered, so I vaguely know that I'm, I'm in my home time zone. Don't recognize the weather, which is kind of confusing, but it does kind of puzzle me. How did I get here? So you might ask yourself, how did I get here? Well, I mean, one obvious answer is, is by road. You know, I walked across from the near for j office in Southwark, um, and that, that's one way how I got here. But like, what, why this chap now with you lovely folks? Um, and, and I thought, well, we, we, we've got tools that will help us figure that out. So here is uh, a very, very poor data model. That, that's me. Uh, apparently, when I wear spectacles, I look less threatening. So that's why the photographs of me have spectacles on. Uh, otherwise, my wife tells me I look like I'm likely to uh, you know, uh, commit uh, uh, um, um, acts of violence. My sister once actually told me I'm the kind of person she would cross the road to avoid if she didn't know me. Hence the spectacles, don't need them for today. But that's me, and that's King's College. And at the moment, there's kind of very little context here, right? It's just kind of two floating nodes in a sea of white. But we can start to fill some of this stuff in. So let me tell you a little bit about me. So this is Jim, and you can see that I work at Neo4j, and I've worked there from uh, 2010. And they haven't sacked me yet, so we can assume that, that that's an accurate a uh, uh, high fidelity view of the world. So this, this would be read as Jim works at Neo4j. So now you know a little bit of something about me. I work at the company Neo4j. Cool, um, I can tell you some other stuff about me. Um, and that uh, I have a, looking at the, holy moly. Uh, looking at the dates here, I have an undergraduate degree from Newcastle University. It was awarded uh, in 1996. And I have a reading the small text. I have a PhD from Newcastle University awarded in 2000, which numerically seems weird because that was only about five years ago in my mind. But arithmetically, goodness me, that makes me very old. But we still haven't figured out what on earth I'm doing here. So how did I get here? Well, uh, I have a, a visiting professorship at Newcastle University. Um, I, I suspect not because of my looks or intellect, but because Newcastle think they can tap near for j for a few quid. Jokes on them, we're skinned. Um, but I also know this handsome fella. 
also wearing glasses, I notice. Has your wife said the same thing? Or are you genuinely short-sighted? Genuinely short-sighted. Okay. So, yeah, not because of potentially looking like a miscreant, but actually Nick uh, worked at Newcastle University, and now Nick works here at King's. So actually now you can figure out by laboriously following these uh, relationships from node to node, you can figure out what my linkage is to King's and it turns out that via a shared connection at Newcastle and King's, I am now here. And in fact, we can enrich that graph and just say that Jim knows Nick and Nick knows Jim and that's how I ended up at King's. Yeah, took a bit of time, right? Several seconds of me explaining my fascinating background to you. But if we had a graph database, we could have just done this. This is a query language in Neo4j, it's called Cypher. So many things in Neo4j have a common theme, and the most common theme is that we suck at naming things. We are called Neo4j for heaven's sake. That sounds like a git hash. It does not sound like a database system. But this, despite having a terrible name, is quite lovely. Um, if you haven't seen it before, the idea behind Cypher is that you draw the patterns that you are interested in in your graph, the nodes and relationships, you draw them in ASCII art, and then the database can evaluate those patterns and search for them or store them for you. So here I'm saying, hey, database, find me a path, because we like paths, this is graph world, which starts at a node, that's the round parentheses, which has a label person with the name Jim, with a property pair Jim, and it has some connection to, uh, oh, I've spotted an error, some connection to uh, King's College London, and then uh, return the path and order uh, in, in ascending fashion. Or even better, enrich that path description. So we say, hey, database match, find me a path where I've got a person called Jim that has an outgoing relationship uh, labeled nose to some person unknown. Psst, it's Nick, it's the only person I know that works here apart from Bassa, and he's not in the room, who works at King's College and then return those to me. If we'd done that with a graph database, that would have given us the answer in a fraction of a second, rather than doing it at human time and plotting those lines uh, with a uh, with our fingers. But the model remains. That simple model of going from a dot across a line to a dot is the fundamental idiom in graph databases. And as Londoners, you all know this because you traverse the wonderful TFL graph every single day and you laugh at the tourists that can't make sense of it. I was just in the US, I told them that my office is based in South Walk, just continuing that tradition of trolling the Americans when they come here and say, can you take me to South Walk? Uh, revenge for their rebellious colonies. So look, now we know uh, how I got here. So what comes next? Well, the talk, the actual talk that I wanted to give. I was a bit unsure actually which way to position this talk, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a systems researcher. I'm, a, I'm very interested in fault tolerance and transaction processing. Uh, but it turns out that's quite a dry subject for a lot of people. So instead of doing the kind of systemsy stuff, uh, there'll be a little sprinkling of it for those of you that are interested, um, you know, kind of talking about some of the under the under the hood stuff in Neo4j. But instead, I decided I'd talk a little bit about how graph data can be useful. So we'll go kind of from a top down point of view about how to model and exploit graph data. And um, since if some of you folks are interested in things, for example, like the built environment, I'll, I'll sprinkle some of that stuff in as well to show how we can really model the real world, by uh, kind of a SimCity style uh, in a graph database. So let me first tell you about the software I work on. It's called Neo4j. We've established it's a terrible name, has one really good attribute. It's uniquely Googleable. Uh, you, when you type these characters into Google, you'd find us and our competitors, because they all register that in their searches, but you find us, you don't find anything else. That's the only good thing about this. I'll tell you one element of truth from Neo4j's history. We had the ability to buy the domain neodb.com, which I think would have been significantly better, uh, but we couldn't afford the $2,000 to purchase that domain uh, about 12 years ago, so we're stuck with this terrible name. Now, Neo4j uh, has a data model called the Labeled Property Graph Model, and um, what that means is we can build models like this. So here you see a graph, it's a small graph. It has three nodes, they're the round things, remember those from Cypher? And it has a bunch of relationships and the relationships are directed. They have a start node and an end node, which can be the same, you can loop back. They have a label on them, which tells you about the relationship between the two nodes and you can have uh, property data on them. The nodes themselves can have labels, zero or more labels. So this is a 
two people and a car. And you can see that I've got relationships between them that describe how they interact. So this is somebody with a property pair, Dan, birth date and a Twitter handle. You can see that Dan has a sister, names Anne, born 5th December 1975, and Anne, by implication, has a brother. And it turns out that Anne owns this car, and Dan is a bit of a moocher. He, she's been driving the car like for the last, tw uh, last 10 years or so. It's about time Dan manned up and got his own, uh, I would say. And of course, because Neo4j is a Swedish company, it's a Volvo, right? He's absolutely leaning into the stereotypes here. So if you wanted to ask things like, who drives Anne's car? You could do this thing. You could say, okay, well, I found Anne and she owns a car, and then I can look for incoming drives relationships to determine who drives Anne's car. Now, in this case, it's just Dan. I mean, you would assume Anne would sometimes get behind the wheel as well, but uh, not explicitly in this model. Now, look, this is a small graph. Uh, you could build this graph out of blobs of JSON for all I care. But actually, for those of us that have relational database experience, there are some really inconvenient things in this graph, right? So notice that the people have different property, property data. This one has a Twitter handle, this one doesn't. Those of you that have done any systems programming with relational databases are now thinking, that's awful because I've already got a null, which now means I have to do an if null check in my application code for this. That's awkward. Notice also uh, the way that uh, uh, Dan is joined to the car and the way that Anne is joined to the car, they're different, right? There's not just kind of, you know, uh, uh, ID to ID mapping here. They would be done through different join tables, which is also really irritating. Um, when I, as an aside, uh, this is this is being recorded. Bugger. I'll let you know anyway. Can I tell you a home truth? As an undergraduate, I love databases. We did relational algebra and relational calculus, and we used this really old system called Ingress. And I was like, wow, this is so much fun. Right, like kind of finding answers, so building a model, finding answers, loved it, absolutely adored it. And then as a postgraduate, I was earning money by doing laboratory supervision, I guess uh, some of you folks do that, good way of earning pocket money. And then I discovered that in practice, um, databases are awful and I hate them because when you move to SQL and when you move to models where you need to do joins, particularly where you're doing uh, uh, many to many joins and so on, you end up building these things called join tables. And it really upset me. I'm like, why am I telling the database how to do its job? Like, shouldn't the database be doing its job without me having to tell it how to do its job? And this was the thing that's, that reverted me. Because no longer do I have to tell the database to do its job by making join tables and first, second, third, boys card normal form. And then, because by the way, the dirty secret of the database industry is normal forms do not perform. They're very slow. Then you get someone who really knows what they're doing to denormalize it. Your model is a mess and you have a struggle from there on to keep it up to date. You have a struggle to keep it to match your business requirements. This salvaged me when I first saw this and I was told no, that this is the data model. Just draw things as they occur in the real world and it will all work. Well, one, I didn't believe it. Uh, but two, when I finally accepted it, it was like a weight had been lifted from my shoulders and I was free to like databases again. I would say that this model is substantially simpler uh, than the relational model that we've all been taught at undergraduate level, right? Now, the reason you think relational is simple is because you've gone through a semester or two of education in it. You've done the mathematical background. You've had a real good grounding in this stuff. And you've read 1,272 pages of text. Yeah? This is an amazing book, by the way. Full credit to the authors. It got me through uh, uh, that course. The label property graph model, however, fits on one, what, albeit widescreen, slide. And if I'm honest, actually, it fits in a small book, uh, 209 pages versus uh, 1,200 or so pages. It's a much simpler model to get to grips with. In fact, my colleague, Mark Needham, drew this chart. I have to be very careful about using the word graph and chart where I work. I'm sure I can get fired for calling this a graph. But this is a chart. Uh, and Mark said, look, like, uh, and I felt this as well. When you start using graph, you're like, this is hard. I don't believe this model works. How do I verify this model? Where are my rails? Where's my normal forms that I'm used to? And then over time, you kind of let go. You unlearn what we've been kind of studiously taught about relational databases. And you come into this kind of like happy valley here where you just love graphs and you don't want to go back. And, and that book I showed you a moment ago, I wrote that book several years ago. And um, I, I had to write the, the chapter where we compared graph databases with relational databases. And my colleagues will tell you I was in a foul mood 
for like the three or four weeks when I was writing that chapter because relational databases are just so hard. And I felt like, you know, sorry for myself or something. So once you go graph, you never go back. And I think that uh, uh, graphs are a way of dealing with very, very complex real world scenarios humanely. And if not humanely, then at least it makes things possible. So let me tell you about a real world scenario that I am hugely enthusiastic about. It is, of course, Doctor Who. Now, don't worry, I'm not a mentalist. I don't believe Doctor Who is real, OK? So you don't need to run fleeing for the, for the doors. But the Doctor Who production team, the scripts, the actors, the bacon butties that they serve in a damp Welsh quarry, all of that stuff is real. The episodes are real, right? I've seen them on the actual BBC television. So there's a whole universe here which is complex. Now, Doctor Who started back in 1963, so you thought you were coming for a computing lecture and now we've got like social anthropology. 1963, episode one, an unearthly child. But Doctor Who isn't linear, right? Certainly it's been running from 1963 to present day, but the storyline goes all over the place. One minute they're in the future, the next minute they're in Roman times, the next minute they're in Egyptian times and so on. So it's kind of got this weird like non-linear plot. And it's difficult to be able to model this in, in many of the data models that we're familiar with, with, with relational, with NoSQL models and so on. With a graph, things are different. Here's Matt Smith, 12th Doctor, if memory serves. Any other Doctor Who nerds? Feeling very lonely up here now. You will be Doctor Who nerds by the next three minutes are over. So Matt is, uh, it plays, uh, Matt Smith played the Doctor. The Doctor is from a planet called, don't leave me hanging people, Gallifrey, thank you. That doctor is from Gallifrey and he stole this machine, this machine that looks like an old fashioned police box. It's called the TARDIS. It's a machine that allows him to travel in time and space. It's the whole plot thing of the BBC, right? It was a, it was a machine that was a, a, a allowing him to move around in time and space so that he could educate people about history. Would you believe it was originally an educational show? Um, and it turns out that he's a do gooder. Uh, well, Matt's a, a he, but the doctor is a uh, able to change genders quite happily. Uh, Matt, for these guys, the kind of pepper pot grinders, they're called Daleks, they are they are terrifying, believe me. No one, no one hid behind the sofa. Okay, uh, you're my people now. See, this side of the room are engaging with the lecturer. Uh, yeah, I like these people. Uh, but he also fought people like uh, Cybermen. He also fought these folks, the Sontarans. Uh, and they're not, they don't have, they don't occur very often, but I nicked this slide off my friend Ian and he put them in because he says I look like one. So that was kind of a trap because I didn't want to build the slide myself. So anyway, uh, and he is also uh, quite needy, right? He's quite a needy character. He likes to have friends. So he goes around picking up these folks that are known as companions. Uh, and they're usually human or humanoid because the BBC's wardrobe budget is small. So humans are cheap compared to aliens. And it turns out these folks have got their own story going on. This is Rory and Amy and they're in love and like, oh, like they have a baby and the baby's river song and that grows up to be the doctor's wife, spoilers. Um, and then there is a real world, right? So all of this is kind of fantasy world stuff, but then there is a real world element of this, right? All of this stuff comes together in things called episodes. And you can see here that Amy appeared in this episode Daleks appeared in this episode, Doctor appeared in this episode. This graph allows us to express quite a lot of interesting things. You know, I can also say that uh, the Cybermen appeared in this episode, as did the Santarans, the Doctor, Amy and Rory. So I'm learning a lot about you know, at some corner of the Doctor Who universe. So you pour your data into this, you add uh, labels to each of these nodes, so you know their function in the graph, and then suddenly you've got something that's very rich, right? And even if you didn't know Doctor Who before, um, you could, I could ask you questions now, you non-Doctor Who fans about, for example, in which episode did uh, Amy battle the Daleks? Well, you can do that now. You can figure that out. You can say, okay, these things apparently are called Daleks. This is Amy. Okay, so she appeared in this episode. No linkage at all to Daleks. She appeared in this episode. Oh, look, linkage back to Dalek. So it must be this one, right? So we can find out facts because Graphs are intuitive and flexible and lovely. Talking of Ian, Sontar and Ian. When we're doing graph modeling, Ian has this really good uh, right, idiom. Uh, write out the questions you want to ask, highlight the nouns in that question, 
and those are your nodes that get you bootstrapped to, in uh, building your graph model. And that's how we built out the Doctor Who graph. Ian now has too much time on his hands and has built that. Uh, yeah, go figure. Um, so, for example, if I wanted to ask you a question, in which episodes does Amy Pond battle the Daleks? Simply by asking that question in English prose, following that simple idiom, I now know that there are several interesting nodes that I might want to surface uh, in my uh, graph. And indeed, there may even be potentially relationships that relate those nodes together. So if I wanted to ask that question, of course, now the graph database, as I suggested, would give us this answer. So it would be victory of the Daleks. So now you like graphs and now you like Doctor Who. All right. Now, as a side note, uh, using a knowledge graph of, the, uh, of the, the form I just showed you is pleasant and it is useful. You can encode this data into different kinds of databases. For example, you know, some of us have used knowledge bases, which have been kind of uh, encodings of graphs onto the relational schema. The problem with these is that you end up, as I said, telling the database how to do its job. That's number one. You get modeling complexity. So accidental complexity pours into your model. The second problem is performance. So one thing we know about relational databases is they're brilliant, right? And I'm, you know, I hope my boss doesn't see the recording. I'm genuinely a huge fan. But one other thing we know about relational databases is they're only brilliant until you start joining. And then when you start joining, joins are expensive. They're computed at runtime. And if you've got a large data set or complex, a complex set of joins or recursive joins, as you tend to have in a graph, then these joins get very expensive and they may take minutes or hours to run in a system where it shouldn't. In a graph database, like the FJ, the thing I work on, going from a node across a relationship to another node, I can do, on my previous laptop, I could do about 10 million of those per second per core. So you can explore a lot of graph uh, very quickly. Of course, one of the things that we do like from uh, the relational world is the ability to schematize or constrain. I think actually that's a, a very useful property. In the graph world, we tend not to have schemas up front because they can uh, slow down the development of business information systems. But we tend to be able to have what we think of as light touch schemas or constraints. So you are allowed to constrain parts of the graph that you need to govern and leave other parts of the graph free to grow organically as the system acquires data. Cool. That being said, um, Let's talk a bit more about knowledge graphs, which is kind of a hot topic in both research and industry at the moment. I have to say, I'm a bit bipolar about them. When people show me knowledge graphs, I say, oh, that's that's a graph. And they say, no, it's a knowledge graph. And you may have known, you may have picked up that sometimes I called the Doctor Who graph, I called it a graph. And one time I called it a knowledge graph. That was me kind of testing the water. Am I comfortable with this language? So um, I guess people use this term to distinguish uh, graphs that contain useful knowledge or data from the kind of things that mathematicians might use, right? So uh, in my world, in my view, a knowledge graph uh, is a graph with an organizing principle. And that organizing principle is simply instructions about how to understand the graph, the knowledge, the data. In the Doctor Who uh, example, the organizing principle was kind of weak. It was just uh, labels and relationships with useful uh, names in them to be able to help us to understand. There are stronger organizing principles. And in fact, the semantic web folks have been working on this uh, to a reasonable degree of success for many years. You could, for example, have a taxonomy or an ontology uh, whereby the taxonomy is, uh, or ontology is well understood in a given uh, business domain. And when you apply it to your graph, it allows you to make sense of the nodes and relationships in that graph. You could have some proprietary thing. You could have something written in English prose for all I mind. But the important thing is that it exists. So you have your data stored as a graph and you get all of the benefits uh, of uh, being able to model humanely and performantly. And then you get this layer on top that allows you to unlock the knowledge uh, inherent in that structure. But importantly, although I think the semantic web people were very early to this and they've been doing a lot of good work about knowledge graphs and reasoning and ont on ontologies and so on. I don't think this implies semantic web technology. And in fact, um, most of the people that I know building knowledge graphs really don't care too much about RDF and Sparkle and that sort of thing. They have a, a business problem they need to solve. They have a supply network problem they need to solve, or they have some uh, uh, pharmacological trials data that they need to understand. And for them, 
they just they're pragmatists they just want modern data tech that works and they want to be able to yield knowledge from their underlying connected data structures so i think a knowledge graph does imply an organizing principle so it does imply structure and metadata the form of that i'm uh, more ambivalent about um i'm slightly biased towards neo for j because they pay my wages and i enjoy that because it keeps a roof over my head but one thing i will bring out is that things have changed so this is a piece of sparkle uh, from the same web folks and this is a piece of cipher from Neo4j. And really what we're looking for here, this is a fiber ontology, it's a financial business ontology. Just to say that over, over time we've learned, we've been able to look at things like this, that some web folks, uh, uh, the research intensive folks have produced with W3C, and we've been able to reduce it to this. And I know at some level here in academia, it's like, well, Jim, they're isomorphic. And I get that, right? Yeah, they, they are, they do the same job. And you would say, well, Jim, this is implementation detail. And I would agree at some level it's implementation detail. But when we're building systems to exploit data, to use data valuably, I would rather have something I can read, understand and debug than something that I wrote yesterday and can't read today. I think this is a trend going on in the industry that we are moving towards simpler, I think, frankly, better idioms that we've learned, that we stood on the shoulders of the giants and learned from rather than using this stuff. I am biased, I get paid by the company that writes this one. If I was being paid by the company that writes this one, I'd look for another job. Um, so what are we looking for in a knowledge graph? It has to be connected, like the, the, the clues there, it says graph, so it has to be connected and unifying. We have to be able to acquire and integrate data into the graph easily. That's why we don't want things like relational databases, because then we'd have to do continuous schema migrations, which is a, a terrible, terrible thing to do. Uh, they have to be flexible. They have to give me the flexibility to model the real world. If I want to um, own a car and drive a car, I should be able to specify that because they're different things. I should also, by the way, be able to own a pet and own a car and own a PlayStation, even though those are difficult things to potentially model in a relational database. Something that's becoming more important over time is that these things have to be explainable, right? So we're tending to build systems now that are relatively autonomous and they're producing, they make, they're making decisions or helping us to make decisions. And we have to be able to explain why a decision was made. If I refuse you employment or treatment or I deport you, right? These are important things that impact people. Yeah, I'm not pretty, pretty, pretty Patel, don't worry. Um, we have to understand why those decisions were made and we have to be able to uh, back that up with evidence why. We can't have closed box systems here. We also need to be able to get algorithms to do a bunch of work for us, right? Graphs can be huge. Some of the graphs that uh, Neo4j users use are pushing half a trillion, trillion relationships. You can't do anything with that at human scale. You need the algorithms to, to help you analyze that. Fortunately, we have some of that, right? So many of us will have had, searching for the correct adjective for a moment, lectures, I'll go with a noun in um, algorithms and data structures. Did anyone have those? Enjoy them? Yeah? Fail them? True story, yeah, fail, resat, resat. Because um, <laughs> if only I'd known how useful they would have been in my future career. Um, taking things that we learned that Nick enjoyed uh, from algorithms and data structures, we know there's a broad library of techniques that we can apply to graphs to analyze them. Uh, on our behalf without us breaking a sweat. And importantly, this all has to work at large scale, it has to be performance. So Doctor Who is a knowledge graph? Well, yeah, I, I'd argue it is. I mean, it's certainly um, richer than this kind of, you know, directed acyclic graph here, this mathematical play thing, as I, as I rudely put it. Any mathematicians? Thank goodness for, yeah, mathematical play thing. No meaning in the real world, just some like symbols that they juggle around for. For fun. But actually, yeah, Doctor, the Doctor Who thing, I know it's a bit like daft, it's a bit fun, but it is a it is a knowledge graph. It's a graph. It has an organizing principle, has the, the property graph as an organizing principle. It has data in it and it's queryable for knowledge. We discovered something about the Doctor Who universe, right? We discovered that Amy Pond was in the episode uh, Victory of the Daleks, right? So yeah, we have knowledge. And this, not a knowledge graph. This may well be useful in some domain, but we'd have to go away and find out what that domain is, understand it, apply it to this graph, and then be able to uh, figure out what to do. So in the general case, I think property graphs are a really good underlay for uh, knowledge graphs. They're a good modeling metaphor, they're efficient at runtime, they're very expressive, they're really easily understood. 
Um, there is a graph databases for dummies book. It is like this thing. You could read it in half an afternoon and you would be feeling quite skillful. And it's widely deployed, right? This is not, no longer is this like esoteric tech, like when I joined near for j 12 years ago, where it really was kind of thought of as weird. Uh, this is widely deployed now, including cloud services all over the place. So I will take a seg into uh, spatial features. So in near 4 j we do have, for those of you who are interested truly in bringing the real world into the database, uh, things like uh, point types with uh, predicates with uh, distance function. We have uh, spatial algorithms for polygon geometries in the in the spatial algorithms plugin. There are pathfinding algorithms as part of the uh, graph data science uh, 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 library. And there are other third party uh, add ons like the GraphQL API, which allows us to do spatial and the NeoMap app. Now in uh, Neo4j, we have a, a native point type. Um, so you know, Nick mentioned that uh, I studied in Newcastle, so you can kind of see where this is coming from. I actually used to live across the road from the Scottish and Newcastle Brewery, which was now where the new computer science department is. Um, I, what a coincidence, because they, they, I remember them being relatively drunk. But here we can say, for example, that I've got uh, some business which is in a particular category, so that's the knowledge graph part here. And in, in one of these businesses' uh, properties, I've got this point here. So now I can index uh, geographically. And I can, uh, for example, bring that kind of stuff in. I can bring in things from the, the Yelp public data set. So I'm able to bring in uh, not only uh, knowledge about friends, users who wrote reviews about businesses, but I'm also able to understand where those businesses are, what kind of business they are. So if I'm looking for a sushi place in Soho, I can write that query, plug in the right bits of Cypher, and I will get answers out, and I can then rank them by rating or rank them by social rating. Do my friends like them? I can do things like find in radius. Now, this is a bit of a crappy match clause, to be honest, but I'm finding some business where the business's location has a particular, uh, uh, is centered on a particular point where it's less than a thousand meters away and return me them. In fact, in this the update set, given that point, just over 100 businesses. So you can bring the uh, uh, real world in. This, by the way, I think that's a really bad graph query, just asking for a node. But there, I could equally change it for things like, hey, tell me about businesses that my friends liked at this point. Tell me about businesses that serve vegan foods that th at least three of my friends liked in the last year and tell me about it, where I am right now. So this thing, this thing wraps in very well. In fact, here being a, a do-gooder that I am, Tell me about the same thing again. Tell me about a business which has, uh, which is a member of the Living Wage Foundation, where that business also sells Japanese food uh, and is, uh, sorry, no, sells Japanese things. And it, the things that it sells uh, make sure that it sells the subcategory of some comic, Musashi. I don't know, anyone a manga fan? Uh, apparently that's like popular manga uh, near me. Yeah, so you can start to mix really interesting graph queries uh, with. Um, uh, with uh, uh, geospatial stuff. And you could use that to build this kind of app. So this was a demo app that some of my colleagues built. And it's really nice, you just tell it where you are, you, you tell it your, your preferences, and it will, it will search this stuff for you. And in fact, you can even uh, take that and, and expand it to use uh, things like convex hull and so on. Now, one of the things that I think Neo4j is particularly good at is pathfinding. And this shouldn't come as a surprise, right? The whole of graph theory was predicated on and pathfinding is uh, based on Euler's work, um, trying to minimize the number of steps that the Emperor of Prussia would take as, as he walked around Konigsberg. It's the seven bridges of Konigsberg problem. Question being, can the Emperor walk around uh, Konigsberg, crossing each of the bridges once and only once? And it turns out that Euler could have done the hard work, could have walked it and found out the answer is no. But instead, he did the lazy thing of inventing a whole new branch of mathematics to solve that problem. And the answer was no. So digital twin, as, and I will uh, whistle along so I know that time yeah, is relatively tight. So a digital twin is a, is a digitalized model of the real world. The, the, the genesis of this stuff was CAD models. Right? So people want to be able to build things like jet engines, and they want to be able to perturb those jet engines in such a way to test them. For example, they want to be able to test for bird strike or frost or, or fracture in some of the crystals in one of the blades and so on. And the thing is, jet engines aren't cheap. I mean, I personally don't own one because they're very expensive. Uh, you personally don't own one because they're very expensive. And it would be a bit dumb 
to kind of get one, spin it up, and then like throw ducks at it to see when it breaks, right? That would be the physical uh, uh, twin. So instead, uh, they digitized the stuff and using simulations, they were able to figure out that, for example, failure cases, look for structural problems, look for engineering problems before they were able, before they put the, uh, the stuff into mass production and so on. I think digital twins with a graph becomes kind of child's play, actually. Perhaps not for uh, your kind of you know, CAD level drawings, but for certainly the kind of you know, business information systems that, that many of our lives are built on today. But at scale, knowledge can be intimidating, right? If I showed you like a one million line Excel spreadsheet, you would not enjoy that very much. But actually, I think knowledge graphs are really quite friendly because they're built from these simple idioms, nodes connected by relationships with other nodes. So even huge graphs break down into these simple idioms. And I was wondering, as I stood here looking out at the audience and the folks online, I, I felt like I have to ask a question. Who's an expert about bulldozers? For those of you online, um, there is genuine bewilderment in the room uh, and no one has volunteered that they are an expert on bulldozers, which is disappointing, but not surprising. But a moment ago, you weren't experts on Doctor Who and now you have a little bit of expertise. So why couldn't we do the same for bulldozers, I thought. So, OK, let's become experts on bulldozers. That's the hubris of computer people, isn't it? Like we're not good at anything except computering, but we think we can become an expert on everything. Either that's hubristic or it's because we're used to being the garbage people uh, of the business world. Uh, we have to sweep up after everyone. Anyway, bulldozers. So here's a knowledge graph representing a bulldozer. Why not? I can. It's a real world thing. I'm going to represent it. Big node here says bulldozer. And it says that I, I have a relationship here. It says house component has brakes. That seems useful. Um, uh, house component, transmission, house component, suspension, house component, engine. Now, look, I am not yet a bulldozer expert, but I am slightly worried that it doesn't have digger. Uh, this seems like a fairly lame bulldozer, um, but we'll carry on. So what else does it have? Well, it turns out that these, this bulldozer has been purchased by XYZ Org and it has been purchased by ABC Corp. Now, this is interesting. This is kind of two graphs that's been mashed together here, right? If you think about it. One of these graphs is the kind of bill of materials for a bulldozer, which we are now becoming quite fluent in talking about. And the other part of this graph is like a kind of a purchase like ledger system that tells me who's bought the bulldozer. That's interesting. And it's perfectly OK to mix those in a graph. If I want to query for the bill of materials for the bulldozer, I'll query about components and stuff. And if I want to query for who's bought bulldozers and how much they're paying and so on, I'll query by query for these purchase by relationships. And I'll get a different view effectively, a different effective graph that I'm querying. Cool, we can add more. It turns out that XYZ org owns a specific unit, which is effectively an instance of that bulldozer with a unique ID. So I know now the exact unit that XYZ org owns. If it owns several of them, well, why wouldn't I just have several more owns relationships? I can do that, right? That's how the real world looks. That's how I'd model it in my graph. Cool, we're doing splendidly. So we know, now know about how bulldozers have bill of materials. We now know that people buy bulldozers in the, in the general sense of who our customers are, but we also know something about the specific things that we sold to those customers. So we've got a customer relationship graph building out here as well. So let's mix that in as well, because we can. Graphs are multidimensional, so let's mix that dimension in. And let's mix another dimension in, things that we know about bulldozers as we operate them as bulldozer operators. I, look, I don't know the word yet, Nick, so don't giggle, but I'm learning, right? This knowledge graph is going to help me to learn. So it turns out that uh, I could have a problem. There's some category of common failures. I could have a problem, some category of known issues. So obviously this is a live graph. And then when we learn about bulldozers fail, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna put some stuff, we're gonna attach some stuff there. And it turns out that bulldozers also need maintenance, they have this upkeep. And it turns out that upkeep is required only on the engine. I'm not a bulldozer expert, but the graph's telling me that regular maintenance of some, some kind is definitely required for the engine. Cool, we're learning lots. Now, some of those common failures are to do with the blade lift. Some of those known issues are about engine starts. And uh, an engine has some phase called start engine. Cool. Learning so much about bulldozers that I didn't need to know. And then actually we can expand this part of the knowledge graph. Well, how do I know when it's a belt failure? Well, I hear a whine. Yeah. 
much like when uh, you know Nick sets his students tasks, he hears a whine. So this is knowledge graph for you, then. Nick. And you know, if I hear a grinding, well, that can occur. That sounds like a grinding. It occurs when the blade lift is doing something, which is a common failure on this kind of bulldozer. I am feeling like I know a lot about bulldozers now. Are you feeling quite confident in your bulldozer knowledge? Good, good, good. Because we can do more, right? So, for example, we can also keep the history of specific units, how they've been maintained, have they been recalled, have they broken down and been fixed and so on. So we can start to then look into that and start to relate some of those events to the known issues. So we can start to systemically figure out, hey, is there something that's botched in this batch of bulldozers? Do we keep getting the same specific event where the blade lift isn't working? Is it across the whole fleet? Well, maybe it is, but it turns out that a lot of the time it's used in Arizona, which is sandy. Is that important? Do we have the same thing when we're uh, in uh, other areas? And so that, yeah, that sand contributes uh, to uh, changing upkeep on the engine. And you may well end up hearing things like wines uh, when you're in that area. So even though we knew nothing about bulldozers until five minutes ago, now we feel at least like we have a superficial knowledge about bulldozers, about customers of bulldozers, about specific units, about the kind of places they're deployed in. Nowhere in here did I have to do craziness about join tables. We just had facts and we connected them with lines. And that's how we built out our knowledge graph. And over time, when perhaps we find more grinding or whining or clunking or whatever, we can start to add that into the graph. And we can map that onto the specific units that are used in particular places. So now we can start to ask it questions. We can start to get some value from this knowledge graph. Oi, knowledge graph, tell me about bulldozers that need maintenance right now and where they are. OK, so I build a cipher query. I say, hey, database, find me a pattern where I've got a bulldozer that needs maintenance, that has a, sorry, has a needs maintenance relationship to an upkeep node. And watch and match where that bulldozer has a unique ID to a specific unit, where that specific unit has an outgoing relationship to a particular state and where it is used in a particular condition and return this data to me. So I get this. Ironically, it comes back as a table. I, I, I accept that irony with good grace and humor. Um, but look, it tells me look, I've got two units that are currently needing upkeep. It's unit one, two, three, which is used in the state Arizona. And the condition there is Sandy. And I've got unit four, five, six, suspiciously. Suspiciously like I've typed this and not done the actual query in a database. It's in the state of Florida, which is apparently subtropical. So I've got these two units. So that's interesting. Now, I like this because the query that I've run, it allowed me to take my newfound enthusiasm for bulldozers and very conveniently write queries about them. Yeah, if I just pop back a sec. Given that graph here, it's very straightforward to write this query here because you're just using the structure of the graph to help write that query for you. You say, hey, find me this pattern in the graph, please. Now, ordinarily, this is where I'd stop and you'd all be relieved and you go back to your day jobs and forget about this event. Uh, unfortunately, graphs got more sophisticated because graphs are now being used as the kind of foundation for data science. And in near 4 js world, we think there are kind of levels of sophistication um, that you can use. And level one, absolutely, is build a knowledge graph. Right? Organize your data as a knowledge graph. You're going to get lots of value for that. You know, we can find bulldozers that are breaking down. We can understand uh, common causes why bulldozers fail in sandy areas, all that kind of good stuff. But then we can go up the levels of sophistication. right? So we can start to do things like graph analytics. So taking those graph algorithms again and asking uh, the graph algorithms to do things like, hey, look, find cohorts in the graph, find neighborhoods in the graph, pair the graph down for us so that we can understand kind of, uh, 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 for example, common failure cases so that we can understand common scenarios where interesting things are happening. That comes for free, right? Uh, that comes out of the box. You just need to know which algorithm to run. Am I going to run a uh, an algorithm for page rank? Am I going to run an algorithm for label propagation? Am I going to run an algorithm for neighborhood detection? And then some processing will happen, typically at several minutes, because it's a you know, compute intensive thing to work over a graph, and your answers will come out. Put that back into the graph to enrich it, and your knowledge graph gets better and better. Once you've done that, though, you can then decide, well, I want to build predictive models from my graph. I want to build, I want to do some machine learning. So graph feature engineering is about taking features, 
and using them to train a model. Now, you've probably done this in many databases. You've taken you know, columns uh, out of your relational database, used them as features to make a predictive model. That's great. What we know from the data scientists is, or at least what they claim is, if we have more features, we get better models, we get better classifiers. OK, cool. Well, graphs have more features because graphs have a topology. So I can take the topology of the graph and say, hey, look, not only am I going to have your know, name, age, uh, employer as features, I'm going to also have the page rank of the node. I'm going to have the neighborhood it's in. I'm going to have its, uh, its uh, degree. I'm going to have its uh, label. You have a wide range of things that are only available to you because you have the topology of the graph baked in. So you've now got more features that you can pipe into your machine learning pipeline and hopefully get a better model out of it. Now, if you don't want to do that, you can go one step further and say, look, instead of taking individual features out of my graph, the page rank and blah, 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 why don't I just encode the graph as a feature? So things like node embeddings, things like fast RP and so on, fast random projections, will take a given node and they will turn it into a numerical value, effectively encoding the topology, the local topology of that node as something that you can put into your machine learning pipeline and it becomes a feature. So the graph's topology is a feature in its own right. And finally, the, the highest level of sophistication today anyway, we have our graph uh, networks where we have software that tries to learn a graph, tries to evolve a graph in some useful way. And so using these kind of tools, the algorithms and data science tools, we can start to ask widespread questions about the fleet of bulldozers. Did you forget about bulldozers for a minute? Yeah, now it's, we're back in bulldozer territory. We can start to ask things like, why do so many bulldozers keep failing in arid places like Arizona? And I can do this. Now, this query is a bit more complicated than the previous one. It kind of comes in two parts. So this first bit effectively uh, projects down, creating a, a, a view onto the graph of important bits that I think will give us a clue about why we're getting breakdowns. So I'm asking the database to find uh, a specific unit. And then from that specific unit, I'm going to match where that specific unit is deployed. I'm going to take, again, that specific unit and I look for where it has an outgoing unique ID relationship to a bulldozer, which has a problem which has something to do with the fault. Effectively, I'm saying I want to compute over this virtual graph. And then from that, I'm just going to pipe it into uh, our graph data science toolkit. I'm going to call between the centrality on it, on the breakdowns projection that I've made, and I'm going to get uh, some uh, data back from it. So this bit's going to run pretty quickly. It's going to produce a projection, an in-memory graph. In Near4j, that in-memory graph is kept in some highly compressed, highly parall parallelism amenable format. And then this part here does a highly parallel computation over it. So if I run that, unsurprisingly and ironically, again, I get a table back. And it turns out that the blade lift and starting of engine are very popular reasons why my uh, bulldozers aren't working properly and much less popular uh, belt failure. So if I got to decide where to spend my money, I'm probably not going to upgrade the quality of my belts so much, but I want to look into why the blade lifts keep failing and so on. So there's no need. Is there anything fancy here? This all comes out of the box with a little bit of effort. You, know, you read the graph data science for dummies book after you've read the graph uh, a bit of database for dummies book, you can do this. This is literally hours of work for you to learn. It's not super complicated. You don't need you know, to be kind of um, you know, Turing level genius to do this. Moreover, if, if you're in the business world, this doesn't need to be scary either. So a lot of the times when people are building these kind of complex uh, information systems, uh, very smartly dressed people, will tell you that we need to throw away your old equipment and replace it with my new expensive equipment. And that isn't true either. It turns out that knowledge graphs are very useful. Uh, you can run them on top of your existing systems. Those existing systems have records in them that are useful. You put a knowledge graph over the top as effectively an index. You do the querying in the knowledge graph, and then at the very end, you can drop down into those systems of record. So you don't even have to do like rip and replace stuff when it comes to implementing these things in the practical world. In fact, Neo4j does this very well. Um, so you've seen Cypher queries. Cypher queries can call procedures, and those procedures themselves can call into other databases. They could run SQL queries on your Oracle database, or they can call a web API running from some you know, Reuters or something to get some data that way. And when that stuff comes back into the, into the query through the procedure, it's mixed in with the local graph data and treated as if it was local graph data. So you can enrich your knowledge graph on the fly from those third-party systems uh, without any complex lift and shift. Now, you might have thought that my uh, bulldozers were like fictitious or playful. It actually comes from a real use case. 
Uh, it comes from a company called Caterpillar, or Cat, the renowned fashion boot manufacturer slash bulldozer manufacturer. And they have a knowledge graph that connects actually is more than this. There's about 30 million warranty and service documents. And that provides context for managing its fleet. The goals that they have are to be able to monitor and diagnose their fleet, to be able to get ahead of systemic problems so that their customers are never impacted by it, such that their customers have a lovely time with their bulldozers and decide the next time they're in the market for a bulldozer, they're going to buy one from CAT. And this system has been running for you know, several years now, and everyone is very happy. So the moral of this tale is that knowledge graphs are cool, and they are widespread, and they are useful. They are simple to learn. The technology is now sufficiently commoditized that with a few hours investment on your part, you could be up and running with this stuff. I'll thank you all for listening, for coming along today, for those of you in online as well. Um, and I guess I have a yeah, I have a minute or two for, for questions if you if you have any after that tirade. Thank you all. I think I'm on. Ha, huh, excellent. I can hear myself. Uh, okay, any questions before I ask Jim some questions? Eleanor. Eleanor's a knowledge graph expert, you should know, before she says anything. Do you know about bulldozers? Not so much. Not so much. Yeah, very good. <laughs> do I need to do this? Oh, online. The people online would appreciate it. Um, okay, yes. Um, so a comment first. Um, Rather than knowledge graph expert, I'd say I'm a member of the semantic web community. Uh oh. Yes. Did I say some unpleasant things to no, the semantic no, web no, community? No, 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 no. I think I mean one could argue about your choice of query when you did the comparison between Sparkle and Cipher, and and yeah, but but it's okay. Let's put that aside. But just I, I like my queries to terminate. Yeah, I know. Um, so does everyone else. <laughs> at least in theory, but um, just for a bit of historical context, at least from my point of view, one of the reasons why Sparkle looks the way it does is because of the context in which it was created, which started from the web, right? So it was meant to work with a certain technology stack. Also, it was meant to work in this sort of what I call information retrieval paradigm, at least in my opinion, where you're looking for information that is, could be spread anywhere rather than your database mm -hmm. and, and the enterprise. And you're going to build an index because you're crawling and so on and so forth. And then perhaps when it comes to how you answer queries in, in that context, you make other design decisions. Having said that, I'm not a Sparkle expert and I'm not using it very often, but I just wanted to add this to the discussion. I am 100% in agreement. So I think semantic web on the web makes a bunch of sense. Semantic web in your database makes far less sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, great. Um, so, so to my question now, um, so you, you, the title of your talk says um, humane. Um, and it was, right? The, the audience yes, is yes, in agreement here. That yes, was humane. Yes, but, but who are the humans who work with Neo4j knowledge graphs and what do they do? And so tell us more about the human aspects of, of, um, of the product and of the knowledge graph work that they do. Yeah, so, it, so um, that's actually a very difficult question because a lot of people build knowledge graphs with Neo4j. And some of them are cool and they call their things that they're building knowledge graphs, like the Caterpillar folks. And some of them just say graph and some of them just say database. But actually, I think most folks using Neo4j are building knowledge graphs because they're building a structure with an organizing principle so they can understand it. And so now you've given me the rather tyrannical option of choosing from thousands of projects, some of which I'm aware of, some of which I'm less aware of, but it spans the gamut from social computing, right? That's Neo4j's original use case. If you want social, plug Neo4j into your Python app, was us in the old days. Right the way through now, where people are doing things like clinical pathways, um, if TFL runs on Neo4j, so how do we get here? We got here with a knowledge graph. Um, NASA's knowledge graph on uh, lessons learned, which also is a pattern rather less humanely shared by the military. Uh, so organizing your mistakes we have made and how not to repeat them, that kind of thing. Um, so being able to synthesize out topics and, and learn from history. In fact, I'm very pleased that um, 
there is a are currently a program going to Mars from NASA getting humans to Mars, and they found they got they built a knowledge graph, found some stuff from the Apollo mission that saved them two years of work uh, in the Mars mission, which I was like, wow, that's amazing, so cool, because it's NASA and it's space and all that stuff. But um, genuinely, what we're seeing now is that most data problems are amenable to being solved or helped by knowledge graph. The ob I would prefer to describe by exception those ones that aren't, and those are bulk undifferentiated storage, which end up being dumped in a data lake and never found again. That thing you've got that's been running payroll since 1979, no value in upgrading that, that's still going to be running on like DB2. Um, and then things like where shopping carts, where your concerns are systemic, they're about things like availability and scale, more than getting direct insight into those shopping carts. And whereas a second order, when you finish a shopping cart, the details of that transaction then ultimately flows into a knowledge graph. So I, what, I've got no science to back this up, but I spent my, my wilderness years in between academia and product kind of doing consulting to companies. And I used a lot of relational databases and every single project I worked on, I now realize we were building a graph and we were shoehorning that in. And that spanned telecoms, healthcare, government, finance, all the kind of big industries that you think, I think knowledge graphs are ramp should be rampant there. I think we're at the very beginning of that journey. Sorry, that was a rambling answer. I don't think no, I no, put no, myself no, well. No, I, think, but I, I think it was it quite it was quite an open question. Uh, and I think yeah, that was that, that was definitely very useful. I mean I have a follow up question, but I think I yeah, there's other people. <laughs> Can you press through that one? Hi. Oh, yeah, it works. Nice. Uh, thanks for the talk, Jim. Uh, that was uh, fascinating. I'm, I also spent big chance of my time working on semantic web stuff. And um, the I'm, web... I'm really glad I showed those slides now. <laughs> I was making friends, humane. And so my question is about, so I know the community, I'm, I'm not involved in that, but I know the community is working on this RDF star uh, standard for supporting one of the most fascinating features I, I um, seeing property graphs, which is this ability to annotate the edges. Yeah. And so that's actually my question. So how rich can these annotations be? How arbitrarily large, if arbitrarily large at yeah. all? And how, the, how does that impact query? Sure, absolutely. So the, the nature of the data in the property graph model is that you have properties, key value pairs. So on any edge, any relationship, as we call them, because we try and keep the language humane, um, so we, we avoid vertex and edge because they seem a bit matsy. Um, you can have arbitrary numbers of properties. And the performance of those properties is, <laughs> the answer is it depends. So if your queries depend on reading huge lists of those properties in order to make a decision about whether to traverse a relationship or not, then it's going to be slower than if you just traverse the relationship. And so let me tell you why in Neo4j that's the case. In Neo4j, we actually, we call it, we call it a graph database, but actually we separate the property data from the graph structure. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that the graph structure is held in fixed length records so that we can do record size times ID and we get an offset. And that's what gives us very fast performance to traverse the graph. We're effectively pointer chasing. In the property store, that's really flexible. It's kind of like a column store. So it's really flexible, but it's nowhere near as fast as order one as it is when we're traversing the graph. So a common idiom in Neo4j is use the graph to find nodes or relationships of interest. Once you've found them, dip in and retrieve your properties. But where you can, uh, avoid trying to use properties all the way along your traversals because we know they're mechanically more expensive. Now, we, we manage to uh, kind of uh, keep down that cost by doing things like caching and so on. But we understand that our flexible property store is slower than our rigid graph store. So we prefer to use the graph store where we can because it's more performance. When it comes to things like RDF star, totally get it. Again, on the web makes a bunch of sense. RDF is an interchange format, and now RDF star is an interchange format. It makes some of my customers' lives a bit easier um, because they 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 kind of sort of standardized on on those vocab on those uh, formats. Uh, again, in the database, we don't store it that way. And even if you use things like Neo Semantics, which pretends that Neo4j is a is a is a SEMweb database, once it gets past that layer it's in a completely different format when it's in the database. So I'm, many years ago, I wrote a book called Rest in Practice before I, I came to Neo4j. And we said it in that book very clearly. Look, things like Sparkle and RDF are for the web. 
they are not for databases. Unfortunately, we have this weird thing where, you know, Stardog and Jenner and so on took this technology that's good in a distributed system, the giant graph that is the web, and they packaged it into a database. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why, why would you take something that's designed for the web and then try and make it work in a database which you have full control over? If you have full control over something, optimize for it. And I think that's why I think the label property graph databases are better in this case, because you've got a, a little machine and you fully optimize for that use case. Optimizing for use on the web is a different kettle of fish, and so use different tech for that. The question from please sorry i forgot about you lovely online people you, you have an advocate in the room i will use this microphone um so mohammed is asking what is the difference between knowledge graph and ontologies yeah so an ontology mohammed is an organizing principle and uh it's it is itself just a graph right but it tells you uh, about relationships between categories um so you can say that something is in the category of something something is a a, a sub part of something it allows you to describe it's actually a metadata layer and then you would attach bits of your ontology to relevant parts of your graph so that when you uh, encounter those parts of the graph you can look in the ontology and understand what they mean now one of the other nice things about ontologies particularly if they're standard ontologies is you can share them which means if i've got a graph that i've marked up with a particular ontology and you understand that ontology it can act as a kind of translation layer between my domain and yours which i think is a very useful thing Back in the room. Uh, hi, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was very nice. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a PhD student, and uh, I wish that my the subject of my PhD was about bulldozers, because I think I could go home and write the whole thing just today. So I would like to do the, that. Mechanical engineering in the scruffy buildings across the road. I think maybe you you can change and head over there. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I would like to do that with my own with my own data. But I'm a bioinformatician, so I feel like most examples are going to be way different to what I do, and I don't really know anything about this. Like I used a Neo4j before, and I do like the naming. I like Matrix, so it's pretty cool. Uh, Basically, my question is, what's the best way to learn how to do a knowledge graph and yeah, how to analyze it and use it to actually get uh, good insights from your data? Yeah, so, so I'm not a bioinformatician. I, I know zero about biology. Uh, the last time I looked at it, I was 16 years old. So that is uh, just a few years ago. Yeah, um, two or three yeah thanks, man. Thanks, man. Um, <laughs> So I do know that lots of bioinformaticians use graphs, use knowledge graphs, but I don't personally know what their patterns are, what their idioms are. But if you grab me at the end, I'll give you my email address. I'll connect you into that community because it's a graph. And hopefully some of the folks who really know what they're talking about can help you to give you some ideas about what you can do with your graph. OK, thank um, you. Cool. Yeah, race condition. Distance. Hello, yes, thank you for the talk. Um, um, very insightful. Um, I'm just wondering the practicality of what sort of uh, data types can we put into this uh, analysis, like a structured data and structured data? What sort of formats are we working with? Yeah, so this is a graph database, so it's very much structured data, right? So if you, you know, um, if you throw in just a, a word soup, you're going to get a really crappy graph. Uh, if you are able to, uh, if you've got structured data, it's very good for that. Which is an odd thing. Sometimes folks balk at that and say, well, but it's all it's all intermingled and squiggly. How is this structured data? And it absolutely is because a graph is a data structure. But what we allow in the J and other graph databases is for that data to be variably structured. In fact, we thrive on the presence of structure. The graph is really fast when you've got structure. It's really slow when you have to infer the absence of a relationship, for example. So if you've got unstructured data, like you've got uh, a corpus of words or something, you tend to have to pre-process that and uh, f uh, extract a graph, a knowledge graph from that corpus. You can't just dump the corpus in and have the, the database figure it out. Otherwise, you've just got a big fat mess. Sure. Hey. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, sure. So by the nature of the graph database, uh, does that mean uh, it's more vulnerable to potential attack? So for example, I work on COVID content network a year ago, so modern US social network, and there's the well-known six century rule, 
which by refilling small number of nodes, you potentially gain access or learn something about larger networks. So yeah. what's your strategy on security issue like this? Okay, so th that's a really good point. Thanks for raising it. So graphs are really revealing, aren't they? So, um, you know, so there is a property now whereby if I know, so James Fowler wrote a book called Connected. And in that book, he said, I don't really need to know much about you. I don't need to know your name or your address or, or, or your gender. I would prefer to know about your connected context. So I'd need to know the, the nodes that connect to you. And if I know the nodes that connect to you, I know more about you than if I knew you directly. And I think there's the same thing that plays out across graphs. If I if I can glean some information about the graphs, even if the rest of the graph is um, ab uh, uh, opaque to me, then I can discover things. For, for example, um, you know, if I if I happen to know a particular pattern of you know, nodes connected to this one middle node that seems popular, and then I discover what that middle node is, let's say it's a STD clinic, then I can infer what the people who are visiting the STD clinic are going there for. So I can infer something about their lifestyles. You're absolutely right there. Moreover, the structure of the graph, even if you know nothing about the properties contained, you can process that structure and try and glean information. It's one of the th difficulties I have sometimes explaining to customers who are like, how do I encrypt the relationships? Well, you can't. Because if you encrypted them, I mean, file system encryption, of course, but you can't obfuscate those relationships at the application level because otherwise the database wouldn't work. So what we have to do is just make sure that the database itself is systemically secure. So it's effectively making sure that all of the appropriate authorization and authentication is done before you get into the graph and that you carry a security context with you in the graph. And that means that in Neo4j, we allow you to read, write or traverse the graph. So your view as a power user might be much richer than my view as a general user. And you'll be able to read and write and traverse different parts of the graph than I'm allowed. So our effective graph that we work on will be different based on our levels of authorization. There's nothing we can do, to, as I said, to make the relationships opaque and hide that information, or at least nothing I know about. Uh, but we can certainly use kind of uh, novel techniques that are affined to graphs to make sure that your view of the graph suits your needs and goes no further, and my view of the graph suits my needs and goes no further. And there's a, there's a piece called Correctness Preserving Security for Graphs that discusses this. I'll happily share the paper with you. Thank you. Sure, sure. Online. online. Yes, I have an online question from Elliot, who is asking, are there any places where you think a relational database would be better than a knowledge graph? Elliot, that is a terrible question to ask a graph enthusiast, but thank you for asking it nonetheless. Yeah, th so the first place is you have a system that works and you don't need to change it. Don't don't change it, right? Just just leave it running. It's fine. Don't, don't meddle. Um, the other thing is, is where you have a problem that naturally fits the relational model. So where your data naturally uh, 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 looks like rows and where you don't have to do too many complex joins where the data model is simple. A relational database has the advantages that you already got taught how to do it. So do those things. But the moment that you start doing recursive joins, the moment you start having multiple join tables between multiple tables in some awkward, awkward fashion, the moment you've got if null checks scattered liberally through your application code, uh, it's probably uh, a clue that your structure is more complicated than a relational database can conveniently handle. And then you might be looking uh, at a different kind of database, possibly a graph. Gross. Do we have some refreshments somewhere? We have another question that's coming on. Oh, right, come on. Um, maybe we can take any online questions we can and then we'll poll everyone outside for refreshments for uh, so another question come in from online from Bujar says would a company be locked into the Neo 4J system or can the data be migrated into another system? That is a, also a very good question. Of course, I want people to be locked into Neo 4J because my salary depends on it. Having said that, there are two, two things that you can do to not be locked in. One is you can export the data in a neutral format, comma separated values, JSON, RDF. Uh, whatever you like, and then import it to another system. The other thing, the longer trend, is that there is a thing called the ISO database languages, plural, uh, standards committee, working group, forget which name it is. Uh, and that's a lie, because they only ever standardized one language, it's called SQL. 
they are currently standardizing another language. They will earn their plural. Uh, and that language is called GQL, uh, which is graph query language. So over the medium term, hopefully that spec will be out this year. You'll see all of the graph databases implementing GQL, hopefully in an interoperable way. So you'll be able to move between graph databases as your needs uh, 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 arise. Having said that, we know from SQL that it's not exactly interoperable uh, amongst implementations. I suspect some of that is deliberate. I hope we don't see too much of that in the graph world. Cool. Excellent. Brilliant. Well Thank done, you. Jim. Yes. Lots of stuff there. Great stuff. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for all the questions. Coming, thanks. There are refreshments outside. I think we should thanks, Jim, for talking as well as just thanks for coming.